Thanks everyone who's uh, already here for for showing up on uh, on time and everything to get things uh, get things going for today. I am uh, Scott Santens, a uh, basic income advocate and founder and president of Income Support All Foundation and the editor of Basic Income Today. I'm here with uh, Conrad Shaw and Josh Worth from Commingle. Hello. Hi. And uh, just to give you a quick heads up on what we'll be doing today, um, we'll be here for probably two hours. The first hour will be uh, just a little bit of news, a uh, little, little, little basic income news catch up. And uh, we'll, we, we're joined here today by Mark Donovan as well. And he's with the Denver Basic Income Project. We're uh, really excited to speak with him learn more about what's going on in Denver. And um, I think it's a really exciting uh, project and there's already some recent, um, say preliminary stuff that Mark can talk about that we've already learned. And uh, there's also a, um, an event happening too in Denver and also around the country as well. And we'll get into a bit about that, about the basic income day of action that's going on this week. Um, but just to get back to what we're doing uh, format-wise is, well, the first hour would be mostly uh, uh, with Mark and uh, just all of us discussing the stuff. And then the you're welcome to ask questions in the as a reply to the space. Uh, so text-based questions would be great. Uh, we can incorporate those into what we're talking about. And then the second hour will be um, really mostly Q and A, and we'll be speaking um, with everyone who's who's still around, and um, hopefully, uh, really just kind of you know seeing where that goes with whatever people want to talk about as far as basic income and commingle, and everything else. And um, also, uh, before I start, too, just want to um, mention um, a little bit about commingle. And uh, uh, Conrad or Josh just want to do a quick, uh, I don't know, 30 second thing about about commingle. Yeah, Josh, why don't you take this one and we'll, back and forth. We're working on our messaging. We'll see what, yes. what so, lands better. Um, <laughs> you probably uh, probably heard about this space because you know about commingle. But in a nutshell, it is a money sharing app that we are working on. And the aim is to build a community of people that are interested in uh, forming a place where there are where people will go nobody goes a week without income and so in that way it is uh, forming a universal basic income for the group that we're forming and uh, yeah you should go on to our uh, website commingle.us and learn all about it and of course we've got our crowd fund going right now um, I think we should probably put the link in our comments and uh, yes Conrad, um, anything else? The uh, the link to the crowdfund is in the um, in Scott's top reply to the comments. We also have a fun video we just did that we're uh, we're, we're doing a little messaging push around the actor strikes. I posted that up in the links. I uh, if you want to help us uh, spread that around and, and watch it if you like it. Um, and then uh, we should do an update on the numbers. Um, yeah. We so we have 435 backers, 16 days to go. So we're about halfway through the 30 day uh, campaign. Uh, we've raised fifty one thousand seven hundred fifty five dollars, although one of our matching donors is a uh, still owes a little bit. So we've actually raised closer to fifty five thousand dollars out of seventy five thousand dollars. That puts us over 70 70 percent of the way. Uh, we still have a couple of matching donors. So the next several thousand dollars. Uh, that we raise are going to be worth, you know, um, anywhere from uh, four to eight times, depending. Your money will be matched. Um, so yeah, that's that's about it. Uh, that's what you got. Anything else, Josh? About that? That is uh, good for now. Yeah, and so we'll take questions all about uh, all about commingle. Uh, after this first hour and we may even have some questions for you anybody that's here we want to get as many people involved in uh, in how we develop this 
as we can. So. Yeah, yeah, they're looking uh, for volunteers. So if anybody is interested and uh, wants to help, please, uh, aside, aside from donating uh, and sharing, there's uh, more you can do to get involved with uh, if you would like to. Yeah, oh, that, yeah, the sorts of things. Uh, we're, make, we're making a lot of film content and it's just a few of us. So people with skills in that area, editing, uh, whatever. And uh, we're also old and we don't know how to use social media. Um, so uh, we're doing our best. But if, what do you mean? If, look at us now. Look at what we're doing. Uh, yeah, I, my mind, my mind is melting at this, at this moment. Um, so it's very important as we're grassroots building and everything to build a real, a real network of people and be able to communicate with them. So if you know anybody uh, who is like a legit social media manager type person who would work with us, who maybe volunteer mm -hmm. or um, illegit is fine too yes uh, talented yeah mm -hmm. there uh, we go yeah let us know um thank you okay and um uh, before we get to mark and talking all about denver um just a little bit of news and uh i think this time i really just want to focus on one piece of news that i think is uh really cool and uh, i definitely want people to know about and that's that there is yet another UBI pilot that has seen success. Um, this was in uh, Well, Uganda, and the pilot started in 2020 um, for an entire village of 350 people, where every single person in the village, both adult and child, received, uh, is receiving 15 euros per month. And the plan, too, is for this to continue for seven years, so until 2027. But the first results are out so far, some preliminary results after two and a half years of the uh, base income going on. And uh, just some of those findings are that extreme poverty decreased from 55% to 10%. Food security increased significantly, as did access to clean drinking water. Elementary school participation increased from 70% to 87%. Uh, there was 70% less dropout from work and school due to illness. Many residents built new, more sustainable homes. Uh, residents also invested in land for agriculture. The percentage of households owning cattle increased from 9% to 49%. And ownership of solar panels increased from 19% to 74%. And uh, this article that goes into this also said, given these positive changes, it's not surprising that the residents also told the interviewers that their stress has greatly decreased, such as daily worries about food and medicine, and that they are now more optimistic about their future. So, yeah, this is just uh, yet another UBI pilot and more success and... Um, I'm sure Mark will even tell us some similar things to what he's been seeing in Denver. This is not just stuff that we see over in uh, East Africa. And um, besides that, I would also just mention that uh, in Canada, the city of Waterloo actually just unanimously passed a motion in support of basic income. And this is not to say uh, that Waterloo is going to somehow institute a basic income. But it is to say that there is a strategy going on in Canada where um, city council after city council is just passing motions in support of basic income uh, to help highlight the need for this to get some provincial and federal government action on uh, implementing a basic income. And this is yet just another city council that has voted in support of it. So with that being uh, a little bit of the news, um, Mark, welcome to this space. And uh, yeah, please tell us a little uh, about yourself and, uh, and we'll go from there. Hey, Scott, Conrad, and Josh. Thanks so much for having me on today. Um, I'm a Denver-based entrepreneur who uh, saw people losing their sources of income and stability during COVID and felt the need to, to act and started to experiment with giving out direct cash grants individually to people impacted by COVID in 2020 and saw immediately the powerful impact and started to do a deep dive into the literature. And I found the New Leaf Project in Vancouver and 
Mayor Tubbs mm-hmm. in Stockton and just immediately saw how powerful this was both firsthand and in other programs around the country. And we started organizing and I'm excited to talk with you about that today and share how we got to where we are right now. But we are running the largest uh, basic income program in the country that is focused on people experiencing homelessness. And we've provided over $5.9 million already to our unhoused neighbors in Denver. And we're seeing some really pretty amazing results happening. Yeah, it's really interesting that you were in, inspired by the Vancouver Leaf Project. Um, for those who aren't aware of that, that happened years ago, uh, but also the uh, a peer-reviewed uh, research study actually just came out recently and that made some uh, made a lot of headlines even uh, just like a week or two ago, too. And uh, what happened was uh, in Vancouver... This wasn't a study of base income in so much as a monthly income, but what they did do is provide a um, unconditional um, amount of money of about $7,500 Canadian to to specifically to a group of homeless people. And um, one of those results, uh, aside from you know, reduce homelessness. I, I believe it was uh, 99 days um, of less homelessness. And um, it, it it actually saved more money than it cost in, in terms of reduced shelter costs. So this was uh, $8,100 per person was saved by providing them $7,500. And uh, I just think that's extremely interesting for people who believe that let's say the homeless are to blame poverty any any amount of poverty it's it's people in poverty to blame and they think oh well let's not you know actually help them and it's costly to do that it's it's so costly to turn a blind eye to these things when all that they really need um, all that so many of them really just need is cash is income and um, the vancouver leaf project um, powerfully demonstrated that. And yeah, it's great to hear that Mark was inspired by that. And uh, what's going on in Denver is actually really interesting too, because it's, uh, I can see the inspiration uh, through that because there's a comparison in Denver between a monthly amount of $1,000 per person uh, compared to a monthly amount of 500 in addition to an initial amount of, uh, what is it, 6500 or $6,000 right up front, Mark? It's 6500 up front and then $500 a month for 11 months. Yeah. Right. And, uh, yeah, we, we got in touch with Claire Williams up there and her team early mm-hmm. on, and they were super supportive. We were really inspired by their results and how they approached it. And, um, you know, and the results they had were, you know, amazing and not – surprising again to anybody that's working in this space but it, they push back on a number of you know the common misconceptions about what people might do given this money and you know you say like people say oh this is so expensive and i'm always my reply is always like how do we afford what we're doing right now <laughs> like yeah the exactly what we're doing right now with the downstream effects of people experiencing homelessness are staggering and we kind of ignore that and then just like it's, you know, it's not a question of whether we have resources um, at all. Yeah, I really hope that people start to see that poverty is not free. It it doesn't, uh, to to say, oh, let's not spend any money on reducing poverty. It's just ridiculous to think that, that we aren't already paying this. Like, it's just, it's, it's invisible. It's like, we're not seeing a lot of these costs are not labeled as being, oh, this is because of poverty. But like when people say it, pay a certain price at a certain store, you know, that store has their prices even based on what's being stolen. Um, so there's a, you know, crime costs baked into what we just pay all of the time. And when we pay for our health insurance premiums, you know, the, the health insurance premiums are taking into account the costs of the uninsured and those costs are borne by all of us indirectly and 
sure enough, like just so many of these things, we're, we're, we're paying this tax on poverty all the time. But because it's not labeled that way, it's, it's harder to actually say, well, it's just actually spend the money to reduce it. Yes. I like those ex examples too, because those are ones you don't as immediately think of. I'm used to hearing UBI uh, advocates or other ad spending advocates talking about like the cost of crime itself. Like how much mm -hmm. does it cost to keep someone in prison? It's uh, depending on where you are, it's like 30 to a hundred thousand dollars a year to keep someone in prison. And so, you know, 15 grand a year, that's going to keep someone from ending up in that situation saves us a lot of money. And that's like a direct cost or a hospitalization emergencies. But even these, like these, these market, uh, these, these more nuanced market based, you know, uh, sort of uh, ripple effects, you know, everything costs a little bit more because everything's a little efficient and you have to account for, you have to account for it uh, over and over again. It's almost like the, the velocity of inefficiency as opposed to the velocity of money. Right. And, you know, I was in a conversation just the other day and, and the comment that was made was, oh, well, as long as you can show the cost savings, um, you know, then people should go for it, which is a questionable assumption and it, in and of itself. But my re reply was like, if we knew that making an investment in people in this way, that even we didn't save money, but their health improved and that, that latent mm -hmm. potential that they have to contribute in whatever way I mean, with their own special gifts is unleashed because they're no longer in the day to day stress of survival or, you know, all of the things that people face when they're on the street or when they're homeless. Um, would we not make that investment in people? You know, so it's like the whole framing is so. Um, um, it's so unhelpful. Yeah, it's, fr it's fraught because you're sort of giving you're sort of giving credence to the idea that it should be like we should be putting a, a number on people's lives, and that the only thing that should matter is are we making money? Like when people talk about like programs that don't make money, it's like the purpose of the government is not to make money. The purpose of the government is to promote the general welfare, and that that is its that is its whole reason for existing. Yeah, a, a, a point. Uh, it, it's it's really unfortunate how you know we, we another another news item recently was the uh, more than doubling of child poverty officially thanks to the expiration of the enhanced child tax credit, and it's just so frustrating how part of the argument about not wanting to do that was like, oh my gosh. Um, you know, we can't spend an extra $100 billion per year um, reducing child poverty. And yet uh, a paper looked at what is the ROI on actually doing that. And it was, you know, 10 times that. So how, how insane is that, that we think that we're somehow saving money in the U.S. by not reducing child poverty um, by not spending an extra hundred billion dollars per year, and as a result, we're fine spending tri a trillion dollars per year. Like, one of the it just <laughs> yeah. One of the things I I say often to people, you know, we're very focused on the unhoused community, um, which we you know we think is in great great need urgently, and it's really important. But I say to other people that kind of there's other uh, areas where this can be applied with great results quickly, you know, whether it's returning mm -hmm. citizens or youth foster exits um, and whatever people are working on. I say, like, if you put an income floor below it, you are going to enhance and accelerate whatever results you're having. So if you're having great results, you're going to have even better results faster with an income floor that creates stability and hope. And it's one of the interesting things we've seen in the early learnings in our project is that we have an active comparison group. So as Scott mentioned, we have three, um, three cohorts in, in a, a very rigorous randomized control trial. One group of people, and I, I wanna point out also, the RCT that we're running is completely volunteer. It, it, it's, people are not obligated to, to participate. So, but over 92% opted in voluntarily because we explained to them that we're working, we want to work with them. And so we approached people with 
trust and respect and said, this is what we're doing. We want to work with you. And so we're getting in incredible engagement. And we have a, you know, one group that's getting 6,500 up front and 500 a month for 11 months. The second group getting 1,000 months, 1,000 per month. But we also have an active comparison group that gets $50 a month. We gave everybody a phone and a year's worth of data or a stipend if they had their own smartphone. And we've been amazed at some of the um, incredible transformations in the active comparison group of people only getting $50 a month. And the research team is calling this the Hawthorne effect, which is we're making everybody feel special. And so, you know, the cash is only one piece of it. A equally important piece is just the relational piece, how we treat people. And often it only takes one person to believe in one other person for them to believe in themselves or them to have hope in a better future. And that hope creates a platform upon which then, you know, a different trajectory may emerge that leads to a much healthier, safer and better place for the individual and for the community. And that's what we're seeing on a small scale in Denver. And we want to bring it to a larger scale. Well, this is ex exceptionally uh, in intriguing to me and us at, 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 with what we're doing in Comingle because we get all the time. UBI in general gets, you know, a thousand dollars a month or whatever they're proposing. You know, that won't pay all my rent. It's worthless. And then, and we're getting, you know, fifty dollars a week is where we're anticipating starting, which is, you know, a couple hundred bucks a month or four hundred for a, a two two adult household. But like, that's not that's totally insignificant. That won't do anything for anyone. Uh, so. So you saying that people getting 50 a month which, um, has a radical impact on people's lives is very encouraging, very much what I look forward to finding out more about. And what, and, you know, kind of a, what I witnessed in general with the, the pilots I've run and studied. Um, do you have like stories or examples from, from that cohort and kind of comparing the types of um, impacts on people within the different cohorts? Yeah, of course. Um, so in, in that active comparison group, we have um, one of our participants was um, fleeing domestic violence, a woman that was disconnected on the street in really bad shape. And she came into one of our partners. Um, and one of our partner, our, one of our, we had four criteria to be in the program. <clears throat> and one of them was uh, that you needed to be uh, connected with one of our 19 partner organizations. And we felt that having trust-based relationships was an important part of this. Um, so she came in, she applied, she got accepted, but then as everybody in, in the $50 group was disappointed, of course, everybody wanted the, the bigger amounts, but at the same <laughs> yeah. time was there. And, you know, the partner explained, we're here to support you. Like we have these services. And one of the things we're looking at with our, our RCT is also the impact uh, across the different service providers with their unique set of wraparound services. And in this case, that provider said, well, we have job placement services. We can, we have housing services. We have a number of things we can help you with. She left, but then she came back a week later and she said, I'm going to take you up on that. I, I want to get into a safe home and they got her into a safe, sober living home. She came back a week later again and said, you said you could help me with work. I'd like to, I'd like to get a job. And so they got her uh, asbestos training and she got a job and she's making more than the caseworker that was <laughs> her in the first place. And she's, she's doing great. I mean, with 800 people in this program, we have countless stories. That's just one from the active comparison group, but we are seeing people, finding their way to housing, finding their way to work, finding their way to better sense of, of safety and stability, financial security. And, you know, you, I'm sure you've been tracking Miracle Money in San Francisco. And, and that was $500. And it doesn't go far in San Francisco, mm -hmm. but oh, two thirds of the people in their initial trial right. found their way to housing. And so, you know, a lot of times people might not feel comfortable staying with a family member, they feel like they're imposing, they can't contribute anything. But if they have a small amount right. or even a medium amount of something that they can contribute, it kind of breaks down that that shame and that barrier that might exist. And so, you know, we are are seeing each pathway is different, but we see that the approaching people this way and then providing something real 
and establishing trust and then working together is a really powerful platform to start from. And it's a community that's so important too. I mean, that's, that's part of what it really excites me of, of trying to move beyond um, this idea of the, theor the theoretical macroeconomic effects of a UBI and whatever. And in designing commingle is about, okay, once we get money flowing, the real magic starts to happen when we connect people as well, you know? So now that we have people in one spot, like how can we offer ways for people to help each other out, um, you know, organically and, um, and yeah, hearing that that's what's going on automatically in your, in your uh, pilot is, is really affirming. Yeah. One of, you know, with, with, uh, with the program in San Francisco, <clears throat> Miracle Money, that was built on Miracle Friends, which was a program that took um, an individual uh -huh. that is on house and matched them up with a volunteer who wants to just have a relationship. And I've done that with somebody here in Denver for now a year and a half, two years. And you just communicate by text or phone and you develop a relationship. You're not a case manager for them. You're just a person for them to talk to and to have, you know, sometimes there are a lot of people that don't have anybody. And that's that's hard. And it can make a big difference. And in that, that, that connection can create, again, hope, which I think is the most important thing, trust and hope uh, in a better future. And if you really think that that's possible, then you're, you're going to believe in, in, in some of the things that you might try, that they, that they might work out for you. And there's been such disappointment with this community being let down. And, you know, our current social safety net has so many barriers and as soon as somebody starts to get on their feet we start pulling mm -hmm. and so um you know it's exciting to see what's happening here in denver and our hope is you know that we can continue to do this and carry it forward and we're the first year is almost over and we're making the case with the city and with our funders that we should keep this going we should not let it just be a one-year program like new leaf or a one-time thing and then produce another piece of mm -hmm. paper saying that this works because we already know it works. We just need to keep doing it. And so I would love to see us sustain this indefinitely. I'd love to, to at least get to a second year to keep learning and expand where we can and see other cities across the country doing what we did in Denver in their own uh, communities to learn, you know, learn with their community how to work together to do better. How are you getting, uh, are you, if you're willing to share, are you getting any traction on year two, year three? One of our questions is, uh, is, is around like what happens when it ends and it's kind of what, you know, we're trying to build commingle for, um, and, uh, and to give an infrastructure that can last permanently and can invite more people in. Um, are you, are you having, uh, good responsiveness about funding another year or two or extending the pilot to some degree? Not yet, actually, which is hugely disappointing, but we're, we're, we, we're still working every day hard to, to raise the funds to, to, to continue forward. But, you know, you know, a lot of people will, are, will sit back and say, I need to see the data. And, you know, that's kind of hunting mm -hmm. it down the road, to be honest. Like, there's a lot of data out there. And it's kind of just like climate change. Like, we know what we need to do. We just need to do it. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know... We um, we're we're close to the end of year one, and um, we need some some big funders to step up. We need the city to reinvest like they did in the first year, and we're in discussions with them, and we're hopeful that they will. But as of right now, we're not there, and so what a dis what a what a lost opportunity we have this rigorous RCT. We have nineteen partner organizations working together in ways that they have haven't before. We have the community involved and we're learning you know the the country is having a discussion now and you probably heard elon on spaces in two days ago talking about ubi and sam allman's running his pilot and this discussion of like what is the economy of the future and what's the role of basic income and here in denver we have a rigorous study that people have voluntarily opted into we're we're getting data to understand how it works and to understand its impact on a community of people that we're all struggling to do better to support. And we're gonna just let it end. I mean, 
it's crazy. But for the investment to keep it going, it's already been de-risked and it's running beautifully. It's it's kind of mind boggling. But that's where we are. I, you yeah. know, within weeks of like having to make a decision is can we carry this forward or is, are we going to be in wrap up mode and and learn what happens when you pull away a benefit again? And we know what happens when you have a benefits cliff, but we don't know what happens when you sustain an income floor for a community of people experiencing homelessness. Wouldn't it be great if we learned that over two years or five years or even 10 years? I mean, we had some of that. We had a two and a half year pilot where the, we had to watch it go away. And most people like kept leveled up for quite a while, but things obviously got harder. We had a homeless individual find housing and he's still in housing to the extent that I know, but you know, it became harder to keep in touch with them. Um, I should. I want to say we should talk a little more offline, uh, you and us, about like maybe we could put a proposal together um, for who, whoever you're reaching out to, because uh, the, the whole idea, one of the um, functionalities of commingle beyond like the national thing that everyone can join, would be to be able to set up like local commingles for pilots and things like that, where it has its own source of money coming in and, and has a, the ability for people to join. Um, and contribute on that solidarity basis. And it leaves this infrastructure upon which foundations and philanthropies can strategically subsidize a pilot rather than having to continuously fund the whole thing. So it's its own existing framework and infrastructure that invites, that shows the ongoing data and impact and invites further subsidy rather than asking some some foundation to you know, be the, the entire source generating uh, a yeah, I, I love the concept. And, um, you know, so I'm often asked, <clears throat> everyone's always asking the question, how are you going to pay for it? Right. And again, you know, HUD has a $50 billion budget, I think, you know, like we have a lot of resources going into housing and, and, and things that are, are trying to address homelessness. But I love the like the concept of commingle. And I don't know if everybody on this call knows what how it works, but the idea of people kind of committing to a 7% of their income going into a pooled fund and then it getting divided equally across everybody in that, that group. I love that because, you know, I was on a talk show with, um, uh, with a libertarian, Russ Kaminsky of KOA here in Denver and saying how oh. he doesn't want the government spending his money. And I'm like, yeah, I would love less government yeah. too, but we got to do it then. Like we have to actually, invest in these things that work that are going to make society safer and better for everybody. It's not going to happen on its own. So just getting rid of government and then not replacing it with a good solution doesn't work. So your concept is brilliant, but it requires people to actually step up and sign up and do it. And that's the hard part because a lot of people have lost hope that any of these solutions can work and we're showing that they can work. We just need to actually get to a critical mass and, take action collectively and we can do that. And I hope we do do that. Yeah. Yeah. A lot I, of the, I, sort of, sorry, the, a lot of the some anecdotal stories we get are from people that, you know, are, are kind of broke themselves, but are saying they want to help other people too. Like they're, they're not <laughs> just because they actually are in this dire situation. There's still this desire to be part of a solution. Yeah, we keep getting these cynical projections from people that people are just going to join to get free money. And then the second they're doing well, they're going to skip out. Uh, Cause I, you know, this is based on this premise that is like the basis of our modern economics teaching, which is that, uh, you know, people are utility maximizing robots and we'll just try to take as much as possible for with as little input as possible so they can be as comfortable as possible. And it's like, that is not what people are. People want to be part of something. People are social creatures. People have love. You know, a, the idea that someone would be helped out of a bad spot through this mechanism and then instantly be like, peace is absurd to me. But also, who the hell knows until we try it? And so mm -hmm. rather than talking about it, you know, we have to try it. We have to take that leap of faith. Right. Um, it's been really encourage encouraging to see the responses from some of the people on um you know, in, in the crowdfund or just engaging with us, the, the people who are really excited about having the opportunity to give, not the people who are really excited about just getting some money, which is obviously a key part of our market, but the mm -hmm. people who are really excited about being able to help and know that their tax 
they're effectively their you know commingle tax dollars or whatever are going to something very clear and transparent and productive and beneficial. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, and also without like without fully understanding that they're actually not going to be contributing <laughs> because they'll actually be on the receiving end of things. Just the idea that you've got some skin in the game and that you're you're taking some responsibility there is it seems to be going a long way. But I've got some uh, questions for Mark, but I know Scott had something to say, so uh, take it away, Scott. <laughs> You might ask uh, something similar to, to what I wanted to talk about next, but what I wanted to, to talk about is even just, it's, uh, it's related just to, you know, the evidence that we're building from these things and just how frustrating it is for me personally, and I'm sure you too, uh, Mark, as far as like the success that we see, and then there's just always something. And so, like, when it came to, uh, again, the most recent report, so this is a go back to the LEAF project and just this, you know, so much uh, success. And then people will look at that. And from a, uh, from a scientific perspective, they'll, they'll eat this apart and they'll look at it and go, well, you know, there was actually a whole lot of people that, that fell out of the control group. And, you know, when you have so much... Uh, so many of the people falling out, then, you know, the power of your conclusions is, is greatly reduced. And, and it's like, well, we're talking about a control group that, you know, even if you're providing $50 uh, a, a month to, to for doing surveys and, and getting this information from, that, um, that it's still extremely difficult uh, for this group. And it's like, well, it's, it's crazy to me to use as like some kind of evidence against helping homeless people to say that we're not sure exactly about how much a program focused on unconditional cash helped the homeless, because even though it showed that it did help the homeless, um, a bunch of them weren't able to continue in the experiment. You know? Right. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's so frustrating for me to see that. And then, so, and then another part of this, so that's like your really rigorous kind of scientific analysis, but then the less rigorous, the, the one that I've seen quite frequently too is, oh, sure. Well, like these programs are screening people for drug usage. And so if you are only helping people who aren't, you know, abusing drugs, then clearly this is going to help people. And so what use is this? Like, this isn't showing us anything. And I look at that and I go, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, clearly this experiment, this, the, what we have seen is that there is some percentage of people who experience homelessness who all they need is just income. That's all they need to not be homeless. And we don't know what percentage that is. Like, maybe it's, 10%, maybe it's 50%, maybe it's 80%. Like we don't know exactly what percentage of people only need money, but we do know that a significant number of people only need money to not be homeless. So why aren't we doing that? And how do we yeah. look at the results of something like this? And no, we need, we need the that. exact data, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, we also saw people who did have drug abuse history and, and, and be in our pilot, we were trying to take the scary cases to, to like fully kick the tires of UBI, you know, and, and mm-hmm. they were the ones, it's the funniest thing was that the people with the, um, uh, addiction, addiction histories were the ones in the end who were still the most skeptical of a full-blown universal UBI that wasn't restricted from people with addiction. And it was a fun, funny moment of like the final exit interview being like, I mean, full disclosure, we picked you because you're in the demographic of people on paper that, a lot of people wouldn't want UBI to go to. How do you think it worked for you? I mean, these are people that turn their lives around. Um, so it's, it's a really funny and complicated issue. I like to think about how much of, of an issue can you solve uh, or mitigate by putting power in the hands of the people to fix it for themselves? Right. And how, like, and, and then what other programs could we right. couple with it? Like you, your other programs, I had a really good question, or I mean, a really... I had a question about something you said earlier about uh, all the other programs you connect people with. And I'm used to talking to all these foundations and, and organizations that their business model is to be like a one-stop service shop for everything someone in crisis could need. It's like, okay, we're going to get you housing. We're going to solve your legal bill. We're going to, uh, we're going to deal with your medical stuff. We're going to talk to your, you know, parole officer. 
and and the person in crisis is so overwhelmed and has no resources and can't do anything for themselves. So to what degree does just getting that person money and, and all of your clients money right off the bat to solve whichever of their own problems they can handle, free up the organization now to, f- to focus more on several different little touch points that need a little extra help um, rather than trying to completely run someone's, someone's life. Yeah. And, or, and, or, or let people fall so far that then that's so complicated and costly. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. this is the thing, like, I, one thing I want to say about like people that are have substance issues is I can't tell you how many people have uh, said to us I've been clean since I joined this program because I don't want to I don't want to lose this opportunity. It's that hope of feeling like mm-hmm. oh there I you know you know why are there's a lot of mm-hmm. different reasons why people use drugs but you know the despair that you face when you're homeless is so deep and so we're seeing that that hope yeah. is giving people the strength and the confidence to push back. And, you know, we said to people from the beginning, once you're in this program, you don't have to talk to us again. You don't owe us anything. This is yours to do what you want with it. And starting from that place, it's, you know, a lot of people think that's a mistake, but what we're seeing is that it, that it works. And, you know, you're totally right. Yeah. So many people have different um pathways and some people it's just cash and a, and like a program like commingle it's so efficient with the distribution of money is amazing like not everybody needs wraparound services but for those that do let's really focus and deliver them better and faster and so you know when i think about what we're doing in denver and how do we get it to the next level like scale um we want to keep running it and show what's possible in Denver. But we want to show also scalability at a national level. So over the next, say, two to three years, we'd like to help others in other areas that stand up projects similar to what we're doing that will show the scalability. Do it in a more conservative Republican region. Do it in a rural area. Anywhere where somebody says, it worked there, but it won't work here. Run the program and show that it works in that community. And then take it to scale. And I've been talking to Michael Tubbs about an idea that I call, you know, we've got mayors for guaranteed income, over 100 mayors they signed on. We have counties for guaranteed income. I'm calling it gar- billionaires for guaranteed income. Let's have them create a fund that could be a matching fund that when a city sets up a program that matches what we're doing to serve our unhoused community, you know, if they get it organized and get their community together and raise, let's say, four or five million dollars, we put in some matching funds. You know, we're going to be producing our quantitative report next month publicly, the interim report. And so you're going to start mm-hmm. to see more data coming out. And, you know, Elon said himself, like, if he sees something that's working, he has you know, he has a philanthropic um, entity that he wants to invest in. And I'm saying, let's let's do that. Let's get Sam Altman. Let's get Jack Dorsey with the Start Small Fund, backing this up and not letting it die, but making it um, making it grow. And I've actually reached out to Lex Fridman to say, I'd like to, to announce the results publicly on your podcast and reach the community out there and have it be heard more broadly and, and get them to the table because it, it's working right now and we need to push forward with it. Have you had any responses from Lex or anybody? And that's, that's a great strategy and that's kind of what we're all shooting for in, in, this, in this environment on social media or in the news landscape. It's, it's really hard to like get anyone to listen to you until you already have, you know, 5 million followers. So yeah. What's your, what's your success rate then? I have it. And that's why I call it out here. If anybody knows, (laughs) maybe, you know, you just keep throwing up these Hail Marys and hoping somebody here understands it and believes it. I mean, how many billionaires do we have in this country? If just one stepped up and dropped, you know, Mm. some money or a couple, like we're funded and we move it forward. And like, for the stop would be tragic and I'm, yeah. it's like, it's it's hilarious when uh, josh i'll turn it over to you in one sec it's hilarious when you see these posts from people who have hundreds of millions or billions of dollars saying just like uh sort of attention grabbing sort of t- posts or whatever like what would you do with a billion dollars and mm-hmm. they want everyone to do the thought experience experiment but they're not listening and you're like jesus man i yeah you know $3 million is our budget to do this or whatever. Like you have a very specific plan and 
you engage in it, but they're not really looking for places to put the money. It seems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like how many, how many check marks do we need to buy before you'll actually listen to what we're saying here? (laughs) Yeah. But I love what you're doing Mm -hmm. with commingle because it, you know, I just started doing it myself and, and I encourage everybody mm-hmm. to do that. That's what it takes. Like if everybody just does what they can, yeah. we get there. And so if people sign up and join, like we don't need the government to run this. Elon's showing us that with Tesla mm-hmm. and, and the way he's moving us towards a clean economy with clean mobility single handedly. You know, we can do it privately if we organize well and if people believe it's possible. And so what you're doing, I think, is 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 brilliant. And I'm really yeah. excited about it. Well, thank Thanks. you. It's very yes. scary to bring it out uh, and start sharing with people and starting to, to try to get, you know, grassroots going when, I mean, yeah, just for the yeah. first time, you know. That's kind of what I wanted to get into a little bit, Mark. Is I just want to know, like, what what is your story? Like, how did you decide that this is uh, sort of something to take on? Like, and were you just doing it single-handedly? Like, how did it all start? Yeah, I... Um... Again, it goes back to 2020. I kind of had some big life changes at that moment. Uh, I got divorced after being in a 30-year relationship in the spring of 2020. I Five years before, I I am a little bit of an Elon Musk fanboy. I've been watching him closely Mm -hmm. for over 12 years. And, you know, in frustration, you know, and I'm an entrepreneur. I've been, I was co-founded a women's sweater company in the early 90s, running out of Bali, Indonesia. And, you know, I, I made some money after, if it didn't make any money for a long time, but made some money once we kind of figured it out, applied lean thinking, I believe in first principles. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so about five years before COVID, I took, I was so frustrated with investment advisors that I couldn't follow uh, my strategy for a sustainable, clean investment portfolio. And I mm-hmm. kept like looking under the hood and I'm like, no, I don't want to invest in oil and gas. I don't want to invest in these things. And they kept missing. And so finally out of frustration, I broke all the rules of investing and I sold everything and put it all into Tesla. And so, okay, wow. <laughs> you know, I, I was like, <laughs> if Elon goes down, I'll go with him because I've been listening to every interview uh-huh. he's given. And I believe in the way he's approaching this. He's trying to take on a really big mm-hmm. existential problem and solve it prob- uh, privately with innovation and um, with speed. And not wait 20 years to be like, oh, like we're right where we started. And so I. Let's get the data first. Yeah. <laughs> so I, um, you know, I, I had a huge windfall from that in 2020 and I just was ready to take action. And I started giving out money to people that were impacted by COVID. And that was it. Yeah, I started mm-hmm. just doing that with like 10 people, thousand dollars a month yeah. in the middle of 2020. And it was so impactful and so powerful for me and those people that I started organizing with local community leaders, um, you know, and I took a half million dollars of those Tesla gains and seeded Mm -hmm. the project myself. And I thought we'd run something small, but that's when the foundations actually stepped in the Colorado trust, Colorado health Mm -hmm. foundation, when collective um, and the city of Denver put in $2 million of ARPA funds. We raised over $8.7 million and we ran Uh two trials you know, I, as an entrepreneur, was like, let's launch in the fall. We can do this immediately. And everyone said, you know, you have to go slower and build trust. And mm-hmm. so we tried a trial and it turned out they were right. But I kept pushing for speed mm-hmm. and we, we organized. We ran a first trial with 11 people in 2021, a second and two partner organizations. 2022, we ran a second pilot with 28 participants and eight partner organizations. And we really figured out what we needed to do to run this really well. Um, at a larger scale and we launched at the end of 2022 and um, it's very doable. Like any city in the country can do what we did. You know, it helps to have somebody step forward with some seed capital and put their money where their mouth is, Mm -hmm. but it's necessary for that. But everybody on this call and everybody in this country can also just support one or two people in their sphere of influence. And that's really rewarding and powerful. And that net effect of that would do more than, just about anything. 
But gosh, yeah, Mark, that, that's why, would you do, why would you do that if you're not making money? Off of <laughs> right. I don't, I don't understand. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, I, I guess it's kind of interesting. Like you, it, it, Elon is basically supporting what you're doing. <laughs> like it, it, the, the original money did kind of originate from, uh, from the belief in what he's up to. So that's, that's interesting to see how, you know, it, it all is you know going in a cycle that yeah way. there's a there's a, a strong connection there and i'm still heavily invested in there but you know i've, I've leveraged mm. myself pretty heavily uh you know i've been selling off retirement funds at 10 percent penalty early to fund mm-hmm. because you know i'm I'm not tax optimizing i'm people optimizing i'm investing right. in people and i'm trying to leverage the opportunity that i've had to create wealth based on unjust systems and push back on that. You know, in Denver, our black community is t- less than 10% of the population, but over 25% of the unhoused population. And it's even more disproportionate mm-hmm. for our native community. And so we have these systematic um, structures in place that we like to ignore, but they are there. And there's nothing that moves us faster towards racial equity, health equity, economic justice than basic income it is immediate and it is powerful and you know my hope is that all of these different movements that are happening across the country right now do feed into a ultimately a a policy at the national level where we create an income floor below which nobody falls but you know if the government doesn't do it maybe we can get commingle up to scale like i, I don't care who does it we just need to do that. <laughs> right <laughs> yeah i mean that's the thinking is it you know, let's show that it's it's not a question of uh the 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 infrastructure you know, it's yeah. more of a question of the will and, and we'll so it, it. we're trying to like just remove the excuses for people you know the data excuse has been pretty well removed by all the the pilots that are going on like you know, you can't just say, "Well, wait for them. wait for prove to me that people aren't yeah, horrible." Like, and, <laughs> you know, it's it, it's more of it's yeah. a lot of issues we're running into. Yeah, the yeah like, excuse is the polit is the political excuse, uh, and that's the other thing we're trying to dodge around by saying, "Okay, whoever wants to join, we don't have to get what is it like ninety five percent of the country has to support something now in order for it to pass in our." In our oligarchy, right? Yeah, that's where. <laughs> no, all yeah. all that matters is the rich to support it. The rich and powerful, then mm-hmm. then then stuff can get done. People always say you're not going to get <laughs> the millionaires and the billionaires, so it won't work. It's like, no, you don't understand. We're building this so we don't need them. That's the whole yeah. point. Is this can have we have to have an income spread, but we don't need millionaires for this to work. They'll help, and it, and it can catalyze. And that, that's the other part of it too is is that just if we make sure that there's some small basic income floor and people are living with it then that can be the kind of catch-22 solver that finally gets us the rest of the way you know people can see it and so we've we've got like a minute left in this hour and um um first of all mark i don't know if you if you need to leave or or not um do you want to leave at here at the end of the hour do you want to stick around for a q a or anything no, like I'd that i'd love to stick around for the q a Cool. Okay, great. And um, so still, even with the end of the hour, um, before the end of the hour, let's go ahead and just uh, just talk about the fact that what's happening there in Denver on Friday and just uh, the rest of the country on Friday, too. Oh, yeah. So it, it's uh, National Basic Income Day, and we are just trying to raise our voices and in support of basic income as a tool to create more economic justice across the country, more safe communities, more opportunity, more fairness. Um, we're having a rally at the steps of the Capitol. We're going to meet at the, states of, the steps of the state Capitol in Denver uh, at 11 o'clock and march um, and make some noise and let the, the mayor and uh, the new administration and the governor and everybody hear how much we want to continue to fund basic income in Denver, in Colorado, and hopefully across the country. And so anybody that's in Denver, come out and join us. We're going to be some speeches and some performances on the steps of the Capitol at 12 o'clock. And we would love to see everybody come out there. And I know that there are movie screenings and other events happening across the country organized by Income Movement. And if you go to their website, there's a map that will show you uh, where there are events near you. 
That's amazing. Shout out to my home state. I'm proud of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's funny. We didn't talk about that at all. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Conrad and I both have connections to uh, Colorado. So that's, uh, that's funny. And um, it, just so everyone knows, too, that um, yes, you can go to incomemovement.com uh, website to, to see the other actions taking place around the country. Uh, but also you can find that link uh, in the reply to this space. So you can also go there, put in your zip code and find an event uh, that's nearest to you that you might be able to go to on Friday. And also on Friday, um, if you don't or go to one of those, or if you want to do this and that, uh, another action online at least is, uh, you know, utilizing the hashtag uh, biggest income day 2023 and um uh i put that hashtag also in the reply to the space too uh so yeah there's lots of things to do on friday that's coming up and i hope that we can uh, make some noise both uh online and offline and um, watch some of these movies uh, including actually um uh the one that we spoke about in the previous space which was uh, raising the floor. That's having multiple viewings around the country too. And Scott, um, Scott, I'd love to just plug you as well because you're my go-to for UBI <laughs> 101. Like when I people are are not, and more people than not are not as familiar with uh, the nuances of this this concept. Uh, you've done an amazing job for such a long time, simplifying it and explaining it, and having so many amazing resources on your site. So. You know, I, anybody that's on this call that is not familiar with that should check it out because he's amassed an incredible uh, and very accessible uh, body of work. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. I appreciate that. I'm glad to hear that it's, uh, it's so helpful. Uh, anybody who uh, would like to ask questions now that we're in the second hour, please um, go ahead and uh, ask for an invite to speak. And uh, we can get some some Q and A going. Uh, oh, I wanted to ask one more question, Mark. You got you have a second to extend that of uh, that bit of it a little yeah. bit more, or it's more of just a thought I want to spitball with. Um, we, we were talking earlier about uh, you know sort of the more cynical argument, uh, like. If, if people aren't buying the whole, here's why we should do this because it's the right thing to do or, you know, ending child poverty, it seems like it's a good thing to actually spend money on rather than make money on. But then there's the second half of the argument where it's also like, but we actually do make money on it. And that's, that's the sort of cold, sort of cynical, cold hearted, like this is actually a smart money play and then the smart investment in society. Um, I've been thinking a lot about like the other side of that. It's like a, the investment play, right? That we don't talk about so often that you were hinting at before with your $50 cohort or whatever, and people sort of um, getting returns on, on that money is just the, uh, the oppor the, the opportunity cost, you know? So we're, we're, we're losing all this money to crime and, and poverty and all that stuff just as an expense, but also the opportunity cost of not having, you know, a hundred million people with a little more freedom to like, pursue an idea to, to create something. Right. And part of yeah. what I really, I really want to figure out a way to uh, share the stories with the data from with commingle is not just how many more people are keeping up with their rent and all the stuff that we'll be tr able to see in bank accounts, but the kind of stuff we saw with our docu-series is like how many people, you know, finally, you know, uh, you know, went back to school or, uh, switch careers or started a company or pursued something they really cared about and and how much how much generative power is that that's that's also like a financial cost argument but it's the opportunity cost of what we're not allowing people to do um just by not allowing them to have the access to that capital yeah i yeah i think that's totally totally true and but the other thing i'll point out is that i think we need to decouple human value from what we define as kind of the traditional productive life, like going to work and making money. Like there are people for various legitimate reasons may never be able to work in that traditional sense ever again because of disabilities, because of 
um, because of trauma experience through homelessness and other 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 places. And so, you know, and especially with like this vision of the potential future of abundance where we don't create these false scarcities and where anybody could have just about anything they need at low cost. Like we need to stop having these expectations about what people have to do to be a part of society and just value people as people and say like, imagine if everybody was just happy and healthy. Like what would that do for society where there's not so much strife and suffering? Like that's a future that I want to strive for. Yeah. And it sounds like that decoupling is sort of something that happened for you in order to even get this. There was sort of like a change in mindset that happened for you. That was like, I I don't want to be valued by my bank account or whatever. I want to be valued by these connections that I have to other people. I think that's pretty, that's, that's important. And maybe like the key. (laughs) Yeah. I also like to decouple value uh, and work from jobs, you know, like a lot of people, when you say productivity or value, they're like, yeah. you know, how, how much did you add to the GDP ledger? Uh, but, and we had these arguments for years with, you know, the, uh, MMT and jobs guarantee world. And I was trying to find a bridge between them. And my favorite framing that I, I like to go with is just, you know, because life is work, brushing your teeth is work and mowing your lawn is work and just loving your children is work. Um, all, all of that, uh, has an intrinsic value, not just, you know, to you and your family, but to society, it makes everything nicer for all of us. So by, by not engaging in self-destructive behavior and not, you know, needing to escape from your life with whatever, whatever, but being, uh, just a, a human being who wants to matter and and be a good person that is work and we should pay for it to a certain degree. And I think that degree that we should pay for it is enough to survive and keep doing it. You know, totally agree. And and, and it doesn't cost that much. And actually, you know, believing in somebody and treating somebody with respect and dignity doesn't cost anything. And if we just did that alone, we would get pretty far as a, as a society. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah and so often like the the jobs that actually the the work that gives you financial return is really has very little bearing on whether it's good for the world or not you know there's there's plenty of jobs there's plenty of ways to make money that are not good for anybody and so tying it tying what you do to whether or not you have money can it's it's a it's a key problem so. Yeah, if, in a, if uh, again, we're looking for questions or comments, so if you want to, um, uh, if you have one of those, then uh, please uh, ask for an invitation to speak so I can upgrade you um, while we wait for, for someone. Uh, there's just something I wanted to, to one, I wanted to go back to, too, which was... Um, um, how one of the things that that has been witnessed in was from the miracle messages experiment or program, um, which was that you know, the story one of the people who was able to find a home, and you mentioned this mark is just being you know it involved moving somewhere else and moving in with someone, and a part of that is is this feeling that you can't do that, you know, without any income. And even if you have a friend or family member that is inviting you to do that, then you will actually say, no, I don't want to be a burden on you. I, I, I don't want to do that, even though that offer is there. And I think that besides applying to homelessness and, and actually housing people, um, by making sure everyone has an income where they do not feel that there's somehow a burden that they're able to put in their share for housing, that this also impacts just relationships in general. You know, this isn't, so part of this is familiar relationships and friendships, but it's also to be romantic relationships where, you know, there are relationships where people um, uh, are fighting, where, where relationships fall apart because of someone 
either feeling like a burden or beginning to look at the other person as a burden, even if they aren't, you know, even if they're, they're doing all kinds of unpaid work, um, they can be looked at as, oh, you're not contributing financially. Like there's so much of our interrelationships in society that go down to this feeling of like, I don't want to be a burden or I don't like it when someone is a burden. And if we have that universal basic income, then I think that it'll just dramatically reduce that particular problem, which just affects so many other problems. I think you're right. You know, we launched the program in November and one of the other comments that came through our qualitative report, which is is on our website. If you go to DenverBasicIncomeProject.org, um, there's the quali- first midterm qualitative report is there was this sense of joy of being able to buy a gift for their kids or family members mm. or, you know, contribute in some way. So I think that's, you know, it's so important. And, uh, you know, this community I have found is so incredibly generous. And so like in my early direct cash experiments that I was running just individually in 2020, I would watch just individuals receive the cash and then immediately start helping the community to, you know, and not so selfless and giving so much. And so kind of proportionally the amount that the, that this unhoused community gives when they receive is incredible and so inspiring. And, um, you know, they, um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, you know, the assumptions that people make about how people will behave when they're given the money are just so off from, from reality. And so I'm hoping as we all tell more of these stories, and, and this is why I'd like to see 100 or 200 cities around across the country doing this work locally so that they can be close to it and they can be a part of it and see it up close and, and understand it better because uh, it makes a big difference to, do, to, to have that kind of proximity. Yeah, we yeah. saw that too in our pilot where and we were embedded with these people filming them. And it's just like the number of times our hearts just like exploded, you know, from from it was incredible. And that is, there really is something to that feeling of shame and, and burden shift that we all have around money. It's just so it's so messed up. So much of our family dynamics are screwed up by it. We have one. So we had a homeless person able to join in with a friend and pay rent. And we had those sort of stories, people able to visit each other in a hospital and miss a little work without, you know, it hurting them. Um, one, there's one that uh, like really touched me two years after in the interview. And this is spoilers, so don't go around talking about this. But um, we had one who was in a relationship with someone in her AA group and um or w- was considering a relationship with a friend in the AA group and their relationship before the basic income was he was a friend and he would try to give her advice and he gave her a little money to try to get her out of trouble, but she was struggling working three jobs. And at some point he decided, you know, this isn't helping you or this isn't good for you. I'm going to cut you off. Um, and she was in a lot of trouble and that was r- right around when the basic income started. And she was this, a story who turned her, her life around a lot. And I bring this up uh, to talk about what happened in their relationship, which is at some point she started getting on her feet and taking care of herself and getting confident. And, um, and they started having a romantic attraction to each other. And when it, it was starting out, he, um, you know, he was still in that I'm your protector mode. And he actually offered to pay, uh, to pay her, you know, <laughs> for, romantic relations let's say and the very awkward moment and she's she told him i want to be with you but don't ever ask me that again or you know like this that's not our relationship anymore um and they both told the story in their own different ways but the just seeing what it meant to each of them that they got through that moment on as peers um was uh that was pretty incredible yeah, I mean, we've seen impact on relationships, mostly positive, but some negative as well. And, it, and it's interesting, you know, um, we've seen a lot of uh, healing with relationships with family and friends, but we've also seen, you know, some um, 
negative dynamics and around people who received and people who did not. And so that kind of mm-hmm. isn't one of the arguments for universality where you don't oh, use yeah. us and yeah. them dynamics, but you just apply it fairly across the entire society yeah. and you, you know, tax or, or fund it in whatever way is is fair and and just right but you know take those dynamics out take those costs out that are associated with drawing lines and administering so again kind of going back to the way you're structuring this like kind of really as clean and directly as possible that to me is first principles cash is freedom to me and poverty is incarceration and so like Mm. you know it's Mm -hmm. it's a really quick way to deploy um opportunity and and freedom to a large group of people very quickly that's right every pilot that's been done has had this limitation uh and so we're like the the extent to which the pilots we're doing now can teach us more it's basically all the data is there you know the closest we have to like a more universality is like the child tax credit or, or or alaska but uh, yeah, we had to tell the people in our documentary, it's like, look, there's only 20 of you. And we made sure everyone in one household was getting it. But it's like, maybe don't tell your friends, it's up to you. But that's not what we're interested in covering is like, a world in which you're getting money and no one else you know, is right. That's not what we want to get a glimpse at. Okay. Um, so yeah, this idea that we can build a platform where anybody can join who wants to. Uh, as I'm very curious what that looks like. Can we start showing certain types of macroeconomic effects that are more societal based rather than individual and anecdotal. So we have a couple of people with uh, comments and uh, questions. So I'll start with uh, Kylea. Do you have uh, what's your comment or question? Hi. Okay. So first off, I do pathway navigation for women who have experienced sex crimes or they're in situations that are maybe similar to what Conrad was just talking about. And my question is, I'm involved with two nonprofits, and we always go through this sort of like issue and concern about just handing out money straight to people and then having the IRS come back to us and be like, what'd you guys do with the money? You know, so I kind of mm-hmm. am curious to talk to other nonprofits that are doing this and see like how they're operating with that. And if anybody here can give me any insight to that, I would love it. I there are a you. lot of good, uh, great resources out there. This discussion has been going on with a, a few in the, the pilot community, which maybe you're a part of. But uh, anyway, yeah, we can pass that on to you. But maybe f- directly from Mark, maybe you have some uh, information about how this might have been, uh, how your program affected people's taxes or, or be- current benefits or anything like Particularly that. Particularly yeah. for the nonprofit mm-hmm. side, too. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When we first started organizing in 2021, even the foundations we were talking about, nobody knew if they could do this. You know, it was it was not as developed as it is now. Um, So we structured the the cash. You know, we're running a a study, which is one piece of it. um, And we are uh, we structured the cash as gifts. And I know commingle is is kind of put some limitations there. So you fall under the gift exemption. And so. it's not taxable to our recipients, but it can impact benefits. And in our case, we were able to get a TANF exemption, but it, we didn't get that for SNAP. And <clears throat> SSI um, is a benefit, with Social Security benefit for people with, with disabilities that are, um, that if they were, had that benefit already, they were likely not going to join the program because the loss of that wasn't worth uh, getting twelve thousand dollars to be thrown off of that, and so, you know, our hope is that it's totally doable. But you know, each each state is a little bit different, so there is a lot of materials both with the guaranteed income community of practice, <clears throat> and just um, some of the playbooks and reports that have been put out by projects that have been run already. So there are a lot of resources, and uh, you can just figure out what the rules are where you are. But, um, you know, what would really help would be an executive order out of the White House declaring a state of emergency on homelessness and treating a lot of these cash benefits, these, you know, basic income programs, um, the way we treated the COVID relief dollars and with exemptions and not impacting right. benefits in this demonstration phase for the next three to five years, that would be super helpful. But yeah, that, how hard could that be? <laughs> That's not, <laughs> it's seen, not a I big mean, ask. No. We're fighting so much Byzantine bureaucracy within the systems as they are. Like Comingle's approach is like, 
we don't know if we can account for, I mean, we know we can't account for all the different things and the different localities and things. So it's just preview it and figure out what you need to know. And if it's not right for you, wait, you know, if it's going to hurt your benefits more than it helps you, then wait. Um, Cause we're not trying to make this fit within a broken system. We're trying to like show something that fixes the system. I know from, for our docu-series, we were so, so light footprint and all over the place that we basically just said, okay, it's going to be gifts. Don't ever report it. If anyone gives you trouble in some locality, we have some money on the side to just pay what they say you owe. Right. Um, and then for commingle, I think it's, uh, we have legal structuring to do that's part of our budget, but the idea is to essentially position ourselves not as like money goes into commingle and then out to people is that it goes through. Like when you, when someone Venmo's you for lunch or whatever, you don't report that to your taxes. It's just money flowing between people. It's not even gifts or it's, it's either gifts or it's just money changing hands between people. Um, and if we set it up like that, um, then really it's just a bunch of people deciding between each other to share their money. Uh, and it's going to be well below the, the tax the tax limit, which is like 16000 now, I think. You can give anyone else in this country $16,000 uh, out of the goodness of your heart. You can give your kids more, I think, and you can give each of your kids or whatever. But that's that's the gist of it is like there's a, there's a, certain, there's a certain amount you can give people without it um, affecting them. So if there's something for your foundation that you can lean into that way and structure it, I know a lot of foundations are having this difficulty with these pilots trying to figure out exactly how not to hurt, hurt their members or their participants. Um, but that was our approach. So, so there's nothing sent out by any of the organizations at the end of the year to the recipients then? There might be. I, uh, one of the things, one of the reasons we had didn't uh, immediately try to set up Comingle as a foundation and instead partnered um, with it's a foundation Scott Scott co-founded with me is uh, to be able to have tax deductibility and all that stuff but also nonprofits as we understand them are pretty limited in how they can give out help and one of those things is they there's like a, a burden of proof for the recipients of assistance yes. being adequately of need which means that those those participants need to fill out all this paperwork and show their pay stubs or whatever like whatever proves that they're you know deserving enough and we have zero interest in, in putting anyone through anything like that with commingle. So, um, yeah, I, as, far, as far as I know, I mean, I, you, what I would say is go on the GICP listserv. Are you on that already? No, I'm not. Look up the general income, uh, no, guaranteed income community of practice. If you let anyone in, just go to the site and try to get on the listserv. And people, this is what most of the um, conversations are about is like, okay, I'm in this state trying to deal with this. Does anyone know how to work through this? And like 50 people respond right away. It's like, you know, come talk to me. And I, 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 I did that in my state. Yeah, so, there are workarounds for what you're dealing with. Yeah, we're not. It's, it's annoying as hell, but, um, but people are working on it. So. We're not Thank sending you. anything out to our participants in terms of like tax acknowledgement, but we are sending a lot of letters on a regular basis, acknowledging their participation in the program that they can use as proof of income for housing. And that's really important. And we found that people that are already have vouchers and that are seeking housing, that it's incredibly helpful for them to be able to have a, a down payment or first month's rent uh, to get into housing because we know how difficult that is even once you have the voucher in hand. And so that's the kind of paperwork that we're are mostly producing for the participants in the Denver Basic Income Project. Wonderful. Yeah, and I do housing navigation as well, so that is super helpful to hear. Thank you so much. Where, that reminds where me too. Right now, I'm in the Southwest region, but I mm -hmm. previously had lived in Denver. Oh, okay. Cool. Well, good that luck. Good, me, keep uh, at it. Mark, I, I wanted to ask, uh, since we're just talking about this, um, have you, have you already, uh, contacted or are you considering working with HUD on their, what they're looking to do as far as experimenting with cash and, uh, partner with, um, uh, philanthropic organizations to be able to test the difference between section eight vouchers and, uh, cash? Yeah. I, I met with Brian McCabe when I was in DC about a month and a half ago, two months ago. And yeah, we were, cool. we're pushing hard for them to go faster and we think it's amazing that they're going to run 
these five or six RCTs and we've said we're ready to go. Uh, you know, it does require some private funding on the on the direct rental assistance side. They've had some meetings already with potential sources of that funding. So, yeah, we think that's incredibly exciting and uh, I want to be a part of it. Great. Yeah, that's good. To, good to know. I'm excited about that, too, to be able like so the potential for a, a system like Section 8 to become cash instead of vouchers. That's like so huge, not only for the people who need it, who will be better served by it, but also I think it's a, it would be a big step forward for basic income to be able to show that how useful and valuable it is compared to even vouchers. Yeah, most uh, most landlords are just like, oh, no, I don't <laughs> take vouchers. <laughs> it's like, okay, so what is this worth? It's nothing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, what is it? Um, the numbers are, first it's, of all, 75% of people who qualify for housing assistance don't get any. So then you're only you're looking at the one of four who get it. And then of the one of four who get it, uh, 40%, uh, I believe, can't use their voucher anywhere. So it just ends up just like being useless. Um, and then, of course, those who are able to use it, they can only live in very specific locations with very specific landlords and they're usually not the best locations and the best landlords yeah so cash just huge difference to be able to enable people to live anywhere uh, patricia um do oh. you have a question next uh, oh okay mark you, you can oh, scott, I was yeah, gonna, continue I first was, i was gonna ask just quickly i'm wondering are you familiar with the house keys action network denver report um pipe Pipe Dreams and Picket Fences that came out about four months ago, five months ago? No, I'm not. Um, I can, I'll, I'll send a link to it there. You can f Google it, but they, they surveyed over 800 of our in-house neighbors in Denver and, and a ton of amazing data. Like you want to know what people who are experiencing homelessness want, go ask them. And they did mm -hmm. that. And the report <laughs> is really powerful, but on like the barriers to housing, the top three were number one, cash, number two, credit, and number three, phones. And so the Denver Basic Income Project covered two of those and through related nice. partners trying to cover the third. But, you know, basic income really is, you know, integrally connected to housing, obviously. And uh, But it's a great report that I'd highly recommend. But sorry, I didn't want to interrupt Q&A. Oh, yeah, no, the yeah, no, that's great. I, I definitely want to read that. Patricia, do you have a, uh, a question or comment? Hi, Scott. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for good. coming again. Thank you. Um, I do. I do have a question. Um, just a little while ago, um, Mark, you were talking about um, metrics and uh it was exactly at that point that my internet decided to funk out. <laughs> so I missed a couple of the things that you were saying. But you were uh, speaking specifically about the cost of poverty. Um, and um, it, I, I was wondering if you actually had those numbers or if you were actually talking about those numbers. For example, here in Canada, um, poverty costs um, anywhere upwards of $72 billion a year. And so we platform basic income in a lot of ways, or um, more specifically GLBI. And <clears throat> um, Scott was saying that like Waterloo, for example, has, um, um, you know, has the idea floated um, the Manitoba liberals, they have uh, platformed it uh, quite recently. Um, and we see it all over and over again, um, from city to city. Um, you know, regularly, it's coming, it's coming. Um, we have a bill for it in the House of Commons here. It's kind of sitting, not doing much at the moment, but, you know, it's coming. Um, poverty is a huge issue, and uh, we're trying to address it, you know, mm -hmm. the way Canadians do do things <laughs> pretty complacently. But um, the number is, um, astonishing how much it costs and my field of study at the moment is poverty metrics and um, you know and most specifically wealth metrics and why there aren't you know why wealth metrics aren't really a th like we don't seem to really focus our energies on wealth metrics so I'm wondering if you like if if I missed 
if I missed that number or if I missed some of like, do you think you could just review that with me? Do you have those numbers? Do you know those numbers? Can you refresh my memory? Please? Well, it's a really hard number to, to, to put a, a figure on. And I, I think I'll turn to Scott, who I think probably has a better sense of that. But what I'd say is I would guess that your cost of poverty is way, way more than $58 billion. If that's all it was, wow, you could end that. Like, and, and we all know we can end poverty in the U.S., almost overnight if we had the will to do it. So I think the cost is probably much higher. The things in our RCT that we are looking at, and we'll have some stats uh, that we'll release publicly next month, are things like, um, you know, number of hospital visits, number of ambulance trips, number of days in the hospital, like well, service interactions, which, you know, you can, you can assign costs to. And so, you know, as we continue to uh, study our data and develop our, our final report in 2024 and share all of our data anonymously open sourced, which is our plan um, to get as many eyes and as much analysis on this as possible. Um, yeah, it's an important piece of it. But as we've discussed, you know, it's not just direct costs, it's opportunity loss, opportunity cost, and, uh, and then just doing the right thing, like, you know, uh, in terms of like how the calculus to make the decision about how to um, what policies to put in place and, and how to, um, you know, how to spend our resources. So you'll see more from us uh, in our quant midterm quantitative report that's released next month and even more into next year when we have the first full year report uh, around the summer of 2024. Do you, Who mind do you have working one? on that? Sorry. Oh, I think you, please go ahead. Is there a particular group that you're working with that's uh, doing the data gathering part of that? Yes, the University of Denver's Center for Housing and Homelessness Research is running the randomized control trial. And we're also collaborating with the other researchers in other, you know, areas, UPenn and spoken with um, like the Benioff Institute. We were watching what's happening in, although there's not mm -hmm. much coming out yet, but open research, you know, anybody that's working in this Chapin Hall, we're mm -hmm. all trying to coordinate mm -hmm. as best we can um, our the way we're asking questions, the way we're gathering data so that we can have like a cohesive, unified, meaningful story to tell at a national level as we move towards policy. So, you know, the wealth of data that's going to emerge in the next three, five, three to five years is, is going to be, it's going to be incredible and really powerful. Yeah. So that's probably a good source for Patricia is to go directly to the researchers. And I, I don't know how willing they are to share their data, but they probably got a good number on uh, the cost of um, of poverty, at least in certain areas. It's probably different I'll, for everybody. I'll just add too to this uh, that it, there's not really a really good study out there about this question, and this is mm -hmm. why it's, it's so frustrating to me. Is when you know you'll, economist after economist will say you know, oh, basic income is too expensive. And, uh, you know, say, okay, so how much does it cost to not have basic income? And no one is really asking that question, except for, I feel, basic income advocates who continually say, there's definitely a cost, but we don't really know. And there is, there are estimates for child poverty, because, like, first of all, child poverty is just so ridiculously expensive, because we're talking about lifelong consequences of years worth of poverty uh, as a child and that just carries on you know through entire lifetimes and that impacts um through three primary mechanisms uh, as far as the evaluation of cost and that's one it's the cost of crime and then two it's the cost of the healthcare system and then three it's the cost of uh, reduced productivity, uh, as in, you know, if a child grows up in poverty, then they're less likely to get a job that pays, you know, 100K a year because of the education that they got and the opportunities that they had to earn additional income and do something that involves higher productivity. So taking those three together is how they calculate the child poverty cost, which here in the U.S. has been estimated to be over $1 trillion per year. Now for adults, again, there just isn't that. I've seen like a good study trying to figure out the cost of crime 
and what that can look like that um, uh, U.S. wide. And I believe that was like two to three trillion dollars uh, per year cost of crime. And so I would estimate that the, the total cost of poverty and I would also add the cost of insecurity and instability um, and the cost of extreme inequality to all of this as well. Is it somewhere, I think, around four to five trillion dollars, potentially more? I don't know. But like it's it's somewhere there as being this very large chunk of our GDP. And um, that's what I would love for some economists out there to actually really try to figure that out, um, some kind of estimate for that. Uh, so that we could say, what is the cost of not having a basic income? Could I ask? Yeah, um, go for oh, it. I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Please go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Um, I'm just wondering, um, where are the right places to access studies like this? So, for example, I, I get, um, I get papers in from academia.edu, and you know. <laughs> Troy Henderson and Carl Witterquist and um, Evelyn Forget are essentially the highlight authors of the papers that I get, but they're, you know, they're foundational basic income papers. I'm, if I was to try and find st studies of this nature, where would I look? Uh, the, I have some bookmarked that, um, that I could send you, but as far as like, one single source, it, it's, it's really um, j j just involves hunting stuff down. It's not really just in one kind of site. Um, so like academia.edu is a, is a great place to, to find these things, um, but it's, uh, it's not the only place. Oh, and, no, I'm uh, sure that's true. And don't worry, I'm happy to go scour <laughs> the internet. <laughs> Yeah, the yeah. Stanford Basic Income <laughs> Lab has a time. Point me the right direction. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. The, even is it with Pen, the... UPenn that does most of the studies with the pilots? Is there... oh. Yeah, you'll you'll be able to find places mm -hmm. like that where you can find links to various studies. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, like the Stanford Basic Income website is a good example of how there's like, uh -huh. you know, kind of a collection of evidence. But mm -hmm. a lot of these places still won't try to collect like these other things that trying to calculate you know the costs of not having a basic income like that's kind of a more general question yeah i know and that's when you because like because mark is talking about something which is which is the unanswered question now you know it's it the poverty metrics the and the metrics in general which are starting to become a little more relevant to how we introduce policy, I think, is <laughs> these are the questions which end the arguments. Do you know what I mean? Like when we're being presented with the arguments which are so tiring, which are the exhausting arguments that we see online every single day, you know, I've started to abstract myself from these arguments because I'm just not having them anymore because we know that people having yeah. a floor <laughs> is kind of obvious, but it's obvious to us because, you know, I don't know, <laughs> maybe it's, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know why it's obvious to us or why it's not obvious to some. I have stopped being able to answer that question, I guess, but mm -hmm. I guess the answer is in the metrics, I guess that's, and I guess. I would yeah, say I don't know part if it of it. is. I think like because <laughs> the, the metrics give people that yeah, like we're saying really, like yeah. it's kind of like an excuse. It's sort of like you're out. You're like, well, I don't have the data yet, so how do I know it's true? Right? Yeah. So it's establishing this truth, which is you know, it's a problem everywhere. And so there's, you can't can you really do that like can you really say like what the cost of poverty is? Like you look at somebody and you're like that that's in poverty you're like there's yeah. the cost like i think that's why you know the stories that like that's why conrad turned to a documentary to prove this point so you i think those those human stories are are even those are hard 
you know, those are difficult to use to convince people that there's exactly. a need out there. So I don't know. I think data is one good way to go for it. But. <laughs> I mean, and yeah. it's, and um, I was listening to him speak as well about um, uh, the, um, I'm sorry, Mark, what, what was it you were talking about? You were saying um, the, uh, the uh, domestic uh, violence victim that you were that you had spoken to, you know, yeah. I'm a member of the disability community. We sit in spaces all the time. They, you know, we we listen to each other talk. You know, we have an umbrella community. We hear awful stories of awful violence committed against people who have very serious conditions, and you know, and and poverty is prevalent in my community. And it's something that we can't escape and it's ongoing and it's forever, you know? And so <laughs> it's quintessential. But the only thing that we can do is just work a way around trying to prove it. And we, um, we, we have to live under the guise of something called the market basket measure. There are 52 different market basket measures in Canada. You can't keep up with something like that if you're always trying to be forced to live under like the cost of living and yet you have the low income cutoff when these two things are separate and it's just it's a nightmare situation and then you've got this whole well it's a whole like well the cost of poverty is 72 billion dollars for the nation well okay great that's one number that's statistics canada it's 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 just a gross figure yeah. Solve a problem. Yeah. Let me solve a problem. So for sure, I will, yeah. I will read every paper on the planet. Every <laughs> yeah. one. I have no we've, issue doing it. But we've uh, got. I, I think yeah, Jacqueline is standing by with a question. But I was going to make. Uh, go ahead. I'm going to make one yeah. one comment about that. Uh, this is incredibly important for the the disability community. Forty nine percent of our participants in the Denver Basic Income Project self reported some type of disability, and the number is probably much larger. And we built the program on a foundation of justice, equity, um, diversity, inclusion, accessibility, and belonging as sort of our foundational pillars. Um, and <clears throat> we think that's really important <clears throat> for all programs to operate and, and build on those foundations and for our businesses too. And, you know, we hear business leaders talk about, and Elon and Peter Diamandis and others talk about, the coming of abundance and how, you know, the rising tide is going to lift all, lift all ships and it will, but if it's built only, if it's built on those principles of justice, and if it's not, we're going to accelerate towards greater injustice and it's going to harm the disability community and our BIPOC communities at a faster rate and disproportionately as it has in every other aspect. And so it's really important that, um, that we focus on those communities um, as we do this work. Mm -hmm. thank you so much for your time i really appreciate it thanks patricia jackie uh did you want to go up next um yes please i was having difficulty hearing the other speakers for some reason i can hear you but i couldn't hear them and i had to put the um captions on Anyway, I was I was going to suggest something. This was something I was working on with um, Angelo Mendoza in Yang Gang when Yang was running on the UBI ticket uh, back in 20, what the heck was it, 2019, about um, gauging the cost of adult poverty. And that was getting the stats on the number of unclaimed bodies in morgues from among, you know, the poor and the homeless, people that don't have families, people that don't have personal safety nets, because that's who doesn't get claimed, right? That or people who do have families, but their families are too poor to be able to, you know, afford to step up and say, yeah, that's my relative and be responsible for final expenses, and um, all I did was something that nobody else was doing, and that was I looked. Um, and this is something that I think could give us a really good start on looking at adult poverty. 
you know, well, is, that is the a, cost that is a of, very, of that. Uh, when you have unclaimed, and you have people that are dying from poverty, and then their bodies go unclaimed in local mm -hmm. morgues. That every is a very grim, county, but probably accurate in every state uh, measurement <laughs> in the United States has a morgue. At least one. So, so yeah, my, my thought on unclaimed that. bodies is a good place to look. Mm. So that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, one. So one of the ways we've built and gotten to the scale that we've gotten to is by trying to stay as positive as possible. People know that people experiencing homelessness are dying at faster rates. There's a 20 year life expectancy gap between somebody that's chronically homelessness and you and I, assuming mm -hmm. you're not chronically homeless. Um, so like what I think is going to motivate people more in my opinion is self interest. And so the idea that by making this investment in a basic income floor that nobody falls below, we will have safer communities, we'll have more thriving communities, that everybody will be in a better place as a result of it. Um, you know, I don't doubt that you can find a ton of data showing the harm that's being done to people, and we can highlight it, but it doesn't seem to motivate people to action. And I think um, focusing more on the collective self-interest might it's but it's, it's a super hard challenge that's just my experience by staying really positive talking about hope um building trust and staying as positive as possible and inviting everybody to the table we've been able to get pretty far in two to three years and we think that's a model that we can build upon and so that's that's what i'd say uh, on that topic it's kind of it's kind of for me too like the, the way we approach our docuseries like um, most documentaries, it's like you sit down uh, to get a, a nice, you know, daily dose of a punch in the gut, you know, like, this is what sucks. This is what's terrible. This is what is overwhelming. This is what we can't handle. Um, and it's, it's just, uh, it, it eventually, you know, people desensitize to some degree or write it off as something that there's nothing can be done about, by, I think, by focusing on how bad it is rather than focusing on what's possible what the opportunities are how much better it could be um and uh that that was what was really lovely about going into so my wife uh Dea invited me to do a docuseries with her and she's done all these issue films that make you want to you know eat 10 gallons of ice cream um environmental <laughs> things and whatever can it's just I, can like can i interject uh sure Okay. Hello. okay. Hello. Yeah. Um, what I wanted to say was part of the mindset, a big chunk of the mindset, at least in the United States, we have to overcome is this, there's a lot of social Darwinism where there's a lot of people who say, well, fine, you know, poverty's expensive. Let's just kill the poor. Fuck them. Let them die. And that's literally the attitude. And I've seen people openly say that on t Twitter now known as X. And, you know, it's literally a real lack of an empathy chip. And I don't know how you can fix that. Well, I, I, that's what I'm saying is I don't think we argue. When you present the facts need... to people and they see that, okay, Scott's receipts make sense, but who cares? So what? We can just get rid of the poor, let them die. And that's why you see poor homeless people getting shipped out to the Mojave Desert without even so much as a bottle of water in places like California. Yeah, and that's a really like a really interesting point. You know, but, you know um, I think the people that you're, so that you're hearing... It's a real lack of will, and this is on the, on the broader part of our whole culture, not just politicians. Politicians are elected by voters who are members of the broader society. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. I, just, I just don't think we're going to be able to argue people into caring enough if they're already over, too overwhelmed and have decided a certain thing. I don't think evidence and, and whatever of how bad it is is what's going to bring it around. That's, that's mm -hmm. what we've been trying. I think what we yeah. need to work on is here's what's possible. So what I was going to say about the docuseries is it was the first opportunity to tell the stories of people who are 
going through struggles and, and life in America through, through sort of a what if lens of like, what if things were different? It becomes a much more, um, it, it's suggestive of, of an answer rather than suggestive of, of, of a problem. And I think people can sink their teeth into that sort of thing. People can get excited about what can we actually do. And that's the whole energy behind the experientiality, not only of the docuseries, but of what we're trying to do with Commingle, which is like, all right, we've, we've argued and argued and argued. Like Scott's been doing this for 10 years. I've been doing it for seven. We've tried to put everything in the right context, show all the data. But what it comes down to, I think, is people need to, we just need to build it and people need to experience it. And so that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, it, I think it really is important to have some kind of, of positive vision. And I think people are, are actually hungry for that too. And as frustrating as it is, like I've seen surveys where you can ask people about like messaging and this is true for, for basic income. It's also true for the child tax credit where, you know, if you, if you were pointing out how the child tax credit reduced poverty and however much, you know, people are upset that child poverty has now doubled with the expiration, it's still not the most powerful message for people to actually support it. And, you know, that could be frustrating, but also I think we have to just acknowledge that and mm -hmm. say, all right, well, what is it that, that, that people support? And one of the most recent, um, one of the most recent studies was showing that the, the ROI stuff actually does increase support where you actually, if you show that it actually saves money overall to reduce homeless, homelessness directly with basic income, then people's support for basic income grows greater than just saying, hey, you'll reduce poverty and homelessness with basic income. Mm -hmm. And so if you're if we take those lessons and, and lean into them um, and just you know meet people where they are, I think that's how, how we actually, you know, move the wheel on this. Mm -hmm. um, Takuma, uh, did you could, have a comment or could, question? Could next? I jump in real quick with one more thing? Sure, yeah, sure, sure. Um, yeah. The Chan Zuckerberg Initiative did a fairly rigorous multi-year study on messaging around housing, and they ultimately mm -hmm. came up with uh, the phrasing of the California dream. And I think the American dream and the concept of freedom and opportunity for all resonates across the political divide. And so that messaging and finding the right messaging, I know the Guaranteed Income Community of Practice and others are working hard on this, is important. And, and then finding that messaging that works to bring people together and create hope in a, in a shared collective better future is what I think is, is the path forward on, on that front. Yeah. Uh, Takuma, did you uh, have a question or comment? Hi. Yeah. Um, so uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. We can hear you. Thanks for, okay. uh, for being here. Oh yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you all for all the work that you're doing. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm also I follow Scott and Conrad and everybody here. Um, so uh, I had two things that I mainly wanted to say. Mm -hmm. um, so one of them was, will commingle uh, eventually at some point? Is there any plan to take it to an international level so that way you could have a a, a larger uh, base of people inside of it to generate the income and the second one was uh so i think we do have allies in the u.s congress and uh like for example we have a uh, lawmaker uh congresswoman ilhan omar who proposed a bill to get uh, some kind of basic income going in the U.S. for a federal push. So I was wondering, is there any plan um, to have? Like, you know, for example, the UFO hearings. Like, we, when we heard about those, they became mm -hmm. national news, and everybody was like, so all the buzz about them. Uh, I, I could talk to my friends, like, at work, and, and if I bring that up, everybody, you know, their antenna will go up. <laughs> but if I talk about basic income, some people don't even know what it is. And it's like, 
so frustrating to have to deal with that. And uh, I, I feel like, you know, if you have Andrew Yang and Scott and, and other people up there in front of Congress, like, you know, you have Mark Zuckerberg sometimes up there for, for, the, for hearings and you have people being, you know, in front of Congress, congressional committees talking about different things, being questioned. You know, I know it's a little bit daunting sometimes, but I thought about it and I thought, like, that's what we need. At least from my perspective and my opinion, yeah. is that I think we do need a little bit of uh, kind of like a federal basic income push. You know, getting mm-hmm. getting the studies out before Congress, showing them the results of the data, that kind of thing. I mean, this data has existed since I came into the movement. Like, they, there's more of it now. But it's a, when I came into the movement, I came from like my seeing my wife's dad's work with the, all this environmental activism type stuff. And the UBI movement was, it was very data heavy, very wonky, very academic. And it's like, if we just really figure out the idea and write a report and put it in the right person's hands, phew, they'll just run with it and they'll just go with it. But the truth is politics is very messy. Ideas have to be mainstreamed, especially something that is so uh, disruptive to the status quo and the way the way money works in this country and the establishment of power, that it has to be millions of people demanding it millions of people knowing about it understanding it and so our theory of change was like we need we need to grassroots this thing and and in order to get that going people really need to get it so yes celebrity uh endorsement something we're always pushing for um along with the experiential side of things but uh, you know the the sub- sort of the subversive thing that we don't say as much about what commingle is it's not just a way to get money to people uh, every time there's one of these pilots or, you know, and the, the Yang campaign, like these things are temporary and people will get locally excited about them. And then when it's over, you try for some news and they go away. But what Comingo really is building is it's, it's a home for the movement to grow and, and live and, and operate in practice that doesn't fade out. So th- there is no deadline. There's no timeline. It's not attached to a specific personality. It is, it's, it's, a, it's a platform. And the idea there is that as we grow and as we make these gains, we draw in more and more endorsements from some bigger names and we draw more and more attention from people and we, we practice it at a bigger and bigger scale to the point where it's, it's not ignorable. Um, and then to answer your first question, we absolutely want to take this international and there's different phases that I would have to go in. Like we're starting in the U S cause we live here and we have a very easy or relatively easy set up banking infrastructure and a population with a high average income. So we could actually just run it, just build it ourselves. Um, and then once it's set up, we could figure out how to do it. And, you know, commingle.us could then have a, a commingle.canada and commingle.germany and UK like there's no reason we can't do these in all these places and they could be separate or interact in some way. And at some point, part of the reason we want to make sure that um, we become a company that uh, is mission aligned, putting all of its uh, revenue beyond overhead towards, towards this work is when we want to spread to countries that don't have um, a high average income or don't have a, uh, um, a well-established banking infrastructure like the countries uh, give directly is doing their pilots. And, you know, they have to go, they have to be a more, it's more expensive to go there because even though their UBIs are smaller, you have to, you know, set up a way to get people um, like a, 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 some sort of crypto dollar on a cell phone or yeah, it's, there's more work to do it. So when, when we have, you know, say we have, you know, millions of people across different, uh, uh, northern countries or whatever western world countries putting money through this thing and we have enough money coming through it at, at scale we can start to invest in these infrastructures in countries that don't have them in places that don't have them we can even endow uh into those ubis um a little extra money a little extra subsidy to make sure that the payouts are sufficient in those areas to be worthwhile. Conrad, those people. I'm, so, I'm sorry to jump in. I've got a, uh, I'm going to have to jump for a one o'clock, but I just wanted to thank everybody for mm-hmm. showing up here. And in, in the last moment, I want to put on my fundraising hat and say, you know, if you believe in what we're talking about, I hope you'll support Comingle and their fundraising efforts to get their platform launched and up to scale and also support the Denver Basic mm-hmm. Income Project at denverbasicincomeproject.org. 
um, so that we can keep running and keep building this and, and do everything you can in your communities and reach out if you have questions. Um, we'd love to, to hear from you. So thank you for having me on today. I appreciate it, Scott, Josh, and Connor. Thank you yeah. so much, yeah. Mark. Thank you, so Mark. Much, Mark. Keep up the yeah. good work. All right. Yeah. Okay, everyone. Let's, uh, Bye. Let's talk <laughs> some more. Take care, Mark. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll keep going. Mm -hmm. um, so those are my answers to that. Um, I'll save my fundraising plug until it. Uh, yeah, I think we're we're pretty much hitting the end here. Yeah, um, unless there's I, anybody I, that's got something they've just got to get out, we will. Yeah, I just want to add that uh, I do think that there is some good potential um, for some hearings that could uh, directly involve uh, basic income pilots next year because Sam Altman, of course, has his big pilot going on. Um, that a lot of people don't know about, but uh, it's been a, a big pilot, two states, $1,000 a month uh, for 1,000 people in the experimental group. And um, five years total, uh, it'll be ending uh, next year, report coming out. And he said that um, when that comes out, he will most likely, you know, that he'll, they're looking to to push this on the hill. And um, it'll align, you know, the timing of that will align so that they'll have the results of their experiment and they'll want to start pushing on the hill. And, of course, you know, Sam Altman is, is someone that can find his way to um, speak before Congress if he, if he wants to and people want him to. So I expect to hear him. And I'm, maybe they'll combine this with some other, like maybe Tubbs and stuff will, will be invited and be speaking about this and... I think you might get invited, Scott. I think if you play your cards, right, you, can, <laughs> you can get up there with that. <laughs> maybe, 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 probably, maybe. Uh, but then, so also in 2025, there's the expiration of the Trump tax cuts, and there's going to be a lot of jockeying around um, in Congress for what happens um, when a bunch of these tax programs expire. Um, what will be the new taxes? What will be the new tax credits? And how do we reform taxes after that? There's a huge window for, for some form of basic income, something um, to happen during that time. So combine that with uh, AI and results from, the, the, from Sam Alton's pilot and others, then there's some ability for something in that window of 2025. But we'll, uh, we'll see. Cool. Well, I have some announcements before we go, um, because this is a we're in the middle of that crowdfund, as Mark mentioned. Um, some some interesting things happened actually during the call. Um, some of you might know that there's been some matching funders going on. We have uh, one more matching funder just told us they want they're anonymously anonymously matching up to ten thousand dollars at a five x. So the next two times we hit a thousand dollar mark we'll get an extra five jumped in from them. Plus the other matching donors we have that actually uh, the next 4,000 or four, four times we hit a thousand uh, that'll be enough to get us to 74,000. So that'll get us like right up to the finish line. And we can do that in the next few days. Um, I'm very appreciative that everyone uh, was listening intently um, and and staying with us here, I noticed during the, the crowdfund, one donation dropped in and it was from my dad. Um, <laughs> so right now we are $245 away from triggering another uh, $8,000 to fall in. Um, so wow. we're in a place where we could end up right. crossing the number, uh, our target in the next couple of days, honestly. And then we could focus on showing, like growing it further and and tell you what like the the bigger plans are and starting to promote that stuff so you know chip in something if you haven't or to, and tell your friends follow along help us really start um ramping up this movement if uh if anything we've talked about speaks to you wow that's some great news to drop here mm -hmm. at the end yeah it was, it was fun <laughs> i just got the email like 20 minutes ago i'm like oh my god i'm supposed <laughs> to talk about anything else <laughs> All right. Well, you heard it here first, everyone. Yeah. Thanks for being in the space. And, and you know that there's, so what is that, a, a 9x multiplier for? Yeah, 9x for the next 2,000. Uh, the next 2,000. I believe. And then, um, yeah. And then after that, it'll still be like, it'll still be 2x for a, a couple more thousand. Right. 
Oh, and the awesome. link to that, if you guys don't know, is in Scott's first um, comment on this, or it's all over at every one of our, our pages. If you follow. <laughs> <it>. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Follow and subscribe to the Comlingle uh, account uh, on 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 the app formerly known as Twitter for for sure. And uh, yeah, thanks everyone for being here today. And this will uh, also, we'll, we'll upload this to YouTube uh, next. So you'll be able to share this with others and other people can hear this who, who missed it. Yeah, the Commingle channel on YouTube. We're going to be pumping out a lot of stuff there too. So mm -hmm. um, that's a fun place to follow. All right, great. So thanks everybody. And uh, I'll see you all, or hopefully all of you, most of you next time. All right. All right. See you. Later. See you, everybody. Bye, everybody.